Okay, and we are back. Okay, so previously I was saying that uh, the lion, the tin man, the scarecrow represent these ideal boyfriend type of characters, these, these fantasy guys who are really nice and, uh, you know, will just be nice to you and take care of you. That makes sense for Dorothy. That's the kind of people that she would uh, be interested in at this time. And, of course, they all have this equivalent in the farmhands, Zeke, Hank, no, Zeke, Hickory, and Hunk. Um, I'm not at all sure which is which. Uh, I don't think most people would know either. Uh, but, you know, uh, so she's basing them on real life in the same way that she's basing the um, the witch on this real life Miss Gulch. But, of course, even though the movie's all about dreams, we don't have to say that it's only Oz that has the dreams. We could, if we wanted to, see that even the real life people are extensions of Dorothy. Why? Because it's a story. Because it's, you know, because uh, all stories are extensions of our minds and how we feel about things. So we can t totally go down that road, too. Um, but in addition to being... Um, being uh, these sort of boyfriend figures, animus figures are also connected to the images of one's father. So uh, you could say that um, the lion, the tin man, and the scarecrow serve an almost paternal role for Dorothy in that they take care of her. Um, and at the same time, they are also aspects of Dorothy's own self. Because the animus is the male part of oneself for a woman. So, you know, those aspects of oneself that one might not always acknowledge because they're not sort of traditionally imagined as feminine, uh, but there they are. So let's think about what does Dorothy learn from the lion, the tin man, and the scarecrow? What's well, exactly what the lion, the tin man, the scarecrow have to learn along the way? Uh, the scarecrow is looking for brains and needs to learn that he actually is pretty smart. Uh, the Tin Man is looking for a heart and needs to learn that he is actually pretty kind. And the Lion is looking for uh, courage and needs to learn that he actually does have courage. Um, so they all re represent these aspects of Dorothy. And I th one thing I think is so interesting is something we talked about previously, which is um, that how does Dorothy first interact with all these uh, figures. Uh, she interacts by helping them out. So she gives them help and they give her help in return. That's a very Jungian thing. That's a very classic dream uh, type of thing that gets expressed in fairy tales and mythology. And how does Dorothy help each of them? Well, she helps the Scarecrow by using her intelligence. The Scarecrow is stuck up on uh, this uh, fence post and she has to figure out with her brain uh, the best way to get him down. So she does that. Um, and then uh, the Tin Man, he is, he looks like a statue, but he's calling for help. He's sort of uh, frozen in place because he's rusted. So she has to use her compassion, her heart, uh, to help him out. Um, she so shows him some love by uh, oiling, by using the oil can on him, and uh, you know setting him free from the rust and saving him. And then the lion, at first he appears really scary, but Dorothy is brave enough uh, to stand her ground and realizes that the lion is actually a big softy. Um, so all three of these guys teach her things about herself. So that is very great animus material. They're serving you know all of these animus functions. Okay. But we haven't yet mentioned the wizard, and I think that's pretty important. The whole story is named after him. So what would we do with the wizard? I would argue, and I don't know if the book goes into this. Let me see. No, it doesn't. I would argue that the, um, that, uh, the wizard is also an animus. Except he is more of a negative animus figure. Um... The wizard is, um, is the wizard is maybe more of a bad figure from this light, um, because the wizard he he makes a lot of promises, um, but he doesn't ultimately fulfill them, and he turns out to be kind of a sham. You know, he pretends he's this great and powerful wizard, um, and then he ultimately um, you know turns out to not be that. He's just faking it all with uh, cinematography and uh, lighting and things like that. Um, so the wizard could represent on some level a bad boyfriend. Um, in that he um, he he makes promises that he can't keep. You know he's not very uh, he's not very real with Dorothy. So perhaps he represents a fear of what Dorothy might fear from men is that they might give her a runaround and lie to her. Um, and this is you know this is a kid story, so it's a pretty kid way of thinking about a bad boyfriend. But you know it makes sense. 
Um, so he he is ultimately a sham. And so maybe part of the story is to is Dorothy learning that men are flawed and how does she feel about that and how does she think about that? Um, but another way to t interpret this is um, the wizard could be an image of a kind of father figure because we can always do both with the animus. Um, so he could be a father figure who doesn't really live up to his image. And maybe that makes even more sense because he's older, he's an old man, he's not sort of young and attractive like the uh, farmhands are. Uh, he is this old man. Um, so the old man is, you know, he's presenting himself as very great and powerful. And isn't that a lot of people's images of their dads, you know, as this figure who's very uh, significant, powerful, and knows all the answers? He knows... He knows all the answers. He can solve any problem. Isn't that how a lot of people feel about, you know, about their dad when they're growing up is um, that, that he, he can solve anything and take care of everything and he knows everything. And then when you grow up, you learn, oh, that's not true. You know, your dad is just an adult, but he's just an adult. He doesn't necessarily have all the answers. He um, he might actually be, you know, not live up to that legacy at all um, in various different ways. Um, and, you know, that's true with all your parents. But for Dorothy, they were kind of focusing on the father figure because that's what's um, uh, important in her life. Um, and she, she, the closest thing we see to her father figure in her uh, Kansas life is um, uh, Uncle Henry. We don't really get too much insight into him, but we could imagine him as being maybe related to this father figure. And we could also imagine that Dorothy's thinking about her own father. She doesn't have a mother, mother and a father anymore. Um, so she's, uh, you know, trying to think about these uh, parental archetypes and how they relate to her. So that means for the shadow um, and the ideal self, we could also put Auntie M into either of those categories, depending on how we want to slice things up. Okay, and then the last thing I want to mention for this reading is the persona. I think there is an example of the persona in this story, and that is the ruby slippers. So the persona, if you'll recall... Uh, in addition to being a video game series, which is actually based on Jung's ideas, so if you ever want to get further into Jung, check out the Persona games. Um, but um, Persona, what, what Persona means in Jung's uh, context is sort of a mask you put on, uh, an identity you wear for interacting with other people. You know, one way of presenting yourself to the world, whether that's a student or a teacher or a mother or a child or a sister or a brother or, um, a, you know, convenience store worker or um, a serious scholar or a sports, you know, you know a, a sports player, a football player, something like that. Um, all these can be different personas you put on. And the way Dorothy uses the ruby slippers is a lot like that. She's given the, the, to them, she's given them by um, uh, Glinda, and the witch wants them but can't have them. Um, almost like she wants what Dorothy has in terms of the way she's uh, presenting herself to the world. And most importantly, the ruby slippers unlock doors for Dorothy. Um, they are one way of, you know, getting her into the Emerald City, showing that she is the one who uh, Glinda has um, put a special blessing on. So they're a sign that Dorothy has this kind of authority um, in the context of Glinda. So I don't know that they represent anything specific. Maybe you could say they represent adulthood, which Dorothy seems to be thinking about. Um, but mostly they represent um, this kind of idea of adult type authority that Glinda gives to Dorothy. And eventually Dorothy realizes that she possesses not because of Glinda, but because of herself. Um, and they also let her get into the Emerald City and things like that. Um, so there's a lot going on here from a Jungian perspective. Okay, um, so if we look at this story, what is the story? It's the story of a young woman who is, um, you know, uh, thinking about growing up, like the girl in uh, Jung's examples, the 10-year-old girl. Uh, she's thinking about growing up. She's trying to process how she's growing up. And she has both positive and negative examples of what it's like to be an adult. And she's sorting out what she wants. Um, and she also has positive and negative examples of men who might be in her life, and she's trying to process what she wants in that category as well. So she encounters this sort of um, witchy lady and realizes that she doesn't want to be like her. 
but she also learns that she uh, she has a brain, she has a heart, and she has courage. And without being sort of aggressive in the way that the witch is, she can learn to take all of these positive, assertive qualities and, and make her own uh, life in the world. And she also learns that there are some men who are going to be good to her, but there are also men who are going to mislead her and be kind of fakes. Um, and so she has to stand on her own ground, not just um, uh, deal with them. And ultimately, this is Dorothy's story, and she's kind of realizing that. Because the lion, the tin man, the scarecrow, they're there to support her. And that's what she really needs in her life, is not somebody who's going to, like the wizard, claim to solve all the problems for her, but men who can be equal partners to her and take care of her. Um, and she realizes by realizing this, she re becomes more like an ideal self. Glinda at the end of the story, um, this sort of beautiful princess figure who can uh, solve the problems and find what she needs in the world. That's Dorothy's story. Okay, in the last part of this video, I want to ask a weird question though. What if Dorothy wasn't the dreamer? What if the dreamer was the scarecrow? Jung says we can do this. We can basically take the story and look at it from somebody else's perspective um, because unlike dreams, there's not just one dreamer. All the characters relate to everyone. Um, so we might identify more with the Scarecrow than we did with uh, Dorothy, um, especially, you know, if this is on gender lines, we might, you know, find that more compelling. So um, let's think about that. So let's say the Scarecrow is the dreamer. Um, what would be the archetypes in his story? Well, uh, it's hard to know what to do with um, the Tin Man and the Lion. They could possibly be ideal uh, uh, selves, um, or they could possibly be shadow selves. Um, they don't seem to relate to him directly so much, so maybe we don't have to think about them as much. Um, what about for an anima figure? Because the Scarecrow is male. Um, and so um, he would be thinking about a female. So for an anima figure, I think we have two really good um, uh, possibilities here. Uh, he doesn't interact with Glinda directly like at all, but he does have a positive anima figure and a negative anima figure. For the negative one, he's got the witch. And for a positive one, he has, of course, Dorothy. Because she, see, she is now the anima figure um, for him. So he is, the, she is this source of this positive femininity in his life, whereas the witch is this evil sort of femininity. So we might say that um, the scarecrow has some anxieties about women in terms of them appearing as these wicked witches, but he is comfortable with Dorothy, who is just a kid, in a way that he's not with the fully grown witch. So that's that's an interesting perspective there. And you could take that in a lot of different directions. Is that ultimately a healthy thing? Is that an unhealthy thing? Um, but for now, let's just say Dorothy seems to be a positive force in his life. She, uh, after all, gets him down off the um, off the fence post. Um, so maybe the Scarecrow story is recognizing, um, recognizing the powerful positive force that women can have in his life and that uh, femininity can have in his life. How about, uh, how about the wizard? What's his relationship to the scarecrow? Well, we could kind of say that the wizard represents like this negative uh, figure of brains. So the scarecrow has brains, but the wizard has kind of used his brains in a little bit of an insidious way by tricking people. So he is a shadow uh, for uh, the scarecrow. He is uh, this negative figure who is, you know, kind of puffed up and arrogant. That would be the bad ending for the Scarecrow, right? If he used his brains to become an arrogant jerk. Um, the wizard's not fully a jerk, but he's, you know, a little bit more in that direction to the Scarecrow. Um, but we could also, yeah, so the question is, do we want to say the wizard is the negative um, version of the, of the Scarecrow, the shadow? Or do we want to say is the ideal self? Um, I think more the shadow, but maybe we could say uh, that um, the ideal self is more sort of the throne as ruler of Oz that the um, that the wizard has, that the scarecrow uh, takes part in. Uh, because in some versions of the story, including the books, after the wizard is gone, you know, the wizard is dethroned. Guess who becomes the new leader of all of the Emerald City? That's uh, the scarecrow. So it's sort of him evaluating, you know, 
uh, his ideal self would be someone who is in charge, but who is not like the wizard. So there isn't a fully fleshed ideal self, but it's implied. Okay, and we'll go into this more in the next video.